Thank you, everybody. So um, I have to introduce myself for the session. <laughs> And I've been at the University of Cape Town since uh, 2005, which is when I really got involved into this whole area of open source running at scale for higher education applications. And that was with Sakai. And we were, as it turned out, a relatively early adopter and sort of ramped it up quite quickly and got into the Sakai community. And um, I became, for better or for worse, also involved in the technical code side and development. Um, more from a sense of, of like, well, you know, you see something that you think should be fixed, and then you think, how hard can it be? And you, <laughs> you discover it's more hard, but it's quite satisfying to like take direct action and fix something you think should be fixed. So I got a little bit more involved in the technical development side than probably I should have, given my actual job title, which is more to oversee the provision of these systems and services. Uh, and then. But four or five years later, we got involved in OpenCast, and it's, it's also an open source project, but it comes from a slightly later, um, not exactly a generation, but it started a bit later. And so you see some of the, the same dynamics, but also different dynamics going on in those two projects, and that's been interesting. And I've been on the, the board of both Sakai at that point and then OpenCast, so thinking about the issues around adoption and um, how these systems get taken up and used, and also obviously having seen a lot of changes in the IT landscape over the last few years. So um, let me then use that to lead in and say this is not an expert presentation by any means. If you're asking for answers, they're not clear, but it's really more about thinking about the challenges that confront us. and as people involved in open source communities and projects, what does the cloud stuff mean for us? Um, and how should we be positioning ourselves for the future? So I've talked about the last decade and the, ne and the next. And the last decade is really one in which universities, and particularly in South Africa, because we've been behind on the bandwidth curve and infrastructure and connectivity, have pretty much been focused on running stuff in our own data centers. Um, so <clears throat> it, it, the cloud hasn't really been a, a sort of mandated jump early thing. There's a certain like, well, if we move it into the cloud, then we're introducing a lot of delay and slowness, and the servers are in the US, and our users are local, and what's that going to do, um, as well as cost issues. But that, that's shifted quite a lot. Um, also, if you look back about 10 years, the, the debate often around software choices was if you were going to license something and run it in your own data center, or if you were going to run an open source product in your own data center. And that debate started shifting around about 2008, 2009 to are you going to run it on campus or do you want some cloud system? And the cloud system in that sense was software as a service solution. So it's like somebody else promises to take care of all of your problems for you, for better or for worse, and like you just throw away the idea that you have to run your own stuff and someone else can do it. That was like the nirvana, and then it wasn't quite as attractive as all that. And particularly in the last year or two, there's been a much stronger concern around these issues on privacy and data security, transparency, and we surrender our lives to Facebook and what is actually being done with all of these data and algorithmic transparency. Are there certain systematic biases that are being reinforced and right down to the level of like is democracy being threatened by the fact that YouTube is promoting extremist videos because they get views and is that what we've given ourselves up to? So there's sort of a sense of wanting to regain some measure of control but we're not totally sure how to do that because we've been so used to saying it can run in the cloud and it's someone else's problem and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, what's changed quite recently is that both um, Azure, Microsoft, and Amazon have or are opening up local data centers. So Amazon's scheduled to launch next year, and Azure, I'm not sure I've been hearing, hearing it's coming for a long time, but um, in theory, both of these will now be local, so we will lose about that. We will lose that latency penalty that there was there for having cloud hosted services in um, Europe or the US. And so now there's not really very much difference, particularly with the improvements in tenant networking and the types of connectivity we have locally. So we could conceivably have a 10 gig connection from our campus into a, 
a local cloud, and then it's basically on the same network as far as performance and speed are concerned. Um, there's been a bit of more focus on risk and IT governance issues, and in the, the roads must fall, fees must fall days, there was a real concern that like data centers were gonna get targeted, so you wanted to shut down the university, but the online presence was still chugging along. Well, you should shut down the online presence. And I don't believe that actually happened anywhere, but it definitely became a risk factor, and it started um, factoring into disaster preparedness plans and like what's in the data center and why is it still there and can we move it out as quickly as possible? Preferably to somebody where, somewhere where like no one knows where it is. Um, but more recently, load shedding is also a risk factor, so we lost uh, our upper campus data center for about five hours recently because the generator failed. And so, and then you think like you can just switch the data center back on, but in fact it takes about three hours for everything to come up, all the services have to come up in the right order. So we had like an eight hour outage and the outrage from the students is like immediate and um, quite visceral to that sort of thing. So downtime is becoming less tolerant and schedule maintenance is also, um, you know, you can sort of explain it to people and say, okay, these systems are going to be down once a month for a few hours or whatever, but I don't, like people, no one expects Google to go down once a month. And so it's becoming less of a, an acceptable thing to say to people that this is what we intend to do as a regular scheduled event, is take away the system that we're spend the rest of the month encouraging to you, you to use 24 by 7. Um, there's obviously also a shift to more online courses, and that means users who are distributed worldwide. And so you want the best possible connectivity from those users to your services. And then there's a whole, um, you know, obviously the higher education, we have a particular set of factors, but cloud services have been advancing across all industries. And so the development environment has, has introduced a whole lot of innovations that sort of thrive in that environment or are well suited to it. So there's the approach to DevOps, to containerization and, and infrastructure as code, which I'll come back to. So th th the landscape has changed significantly and um, I think from a, we can now see many reasons to be in the cloud and the downsides are decreasing, except for one or two still big ones. Um, no one cares where your servers are anymore. This is a, actually a funny ditty that dates from the early internet days, um, but it's actually as equally applicable to cloud stuff. So you would think, like, logically, you should use a computer that's near to you, but nobody cares if you're using a computer on the other side of the world, as long as it's fast. So I think another interesting question is, is the cloud services are probably good for the planet in theory. So there's a question around how many computers we have running 24 by seven that are chugging away. And if they're being idle, then they are using up power and CO2 emissions and global warming as rail. So we should all have an inter interest in efficiency and um, making optimal use of computing resources. And I think there's a, a argument around scale in data centers that we cannot necessarily as individual universities solve, but it makes sense to consolidate computing workloads, particularly where power is plentifully available and it's also renewable in some way, so that we're not contributing to the problem. And there's a lot of engineering going into building efficient data centers by people who run a lot of them. And again, as individual universities, we're not necessarily in a position to, to do that as well. So the next interesting question is if you look at what's going on in open source and where it's competitive, where it's losing out, and where it's challenged. So it's extremely successful because at the infrastructure layer here because all these cloud services are built like 95% on open source stacks. And so you find things like Apache and Nginx and Linux and MySQL and Docker and Elasticsearch, which is interesting, are now the basis of cloud stacks, et cetera. And these are getting incredible amounts of investment from companies whose businesses depend on building higher value services that are using this lower level of open source. So there it's become incredibly successful. It's to the point where it's a little controversial now because um, perhaps it's not a new debate, but there's an argument about the, the business models, et cetera, et cetera, how people make money out of open source. 
And so you're seeing a, like a power struggle between Elasticsearch, for example, who are trying to create a model with an open core and some additional proprietary plugins and Amazon. And Amazon sort of forked Elasticsearch and said, we want a purely free and open, unconstrained, untroubled version of Elasticsearch. And they've done similar things with Java and a couple of others of them. So these sort of interests are playing off against each other, but it's not fundamentally about open source. It's sort of like who's making the money out of it, how they're making the money out of it. Um, so I mean, Amazon's doing that, obviously, because they sell a lot of services on top of that. Um, in desktop applications, you know, in some senses, I think there's some categories where open source has just never quite made the critical mass, and now it's losing out. So I don't know if anyone still uses OpenOffice. Anyone? OK, a few people use OpenOffice. Right. But it's sort of a, yeah, well, I mean, struggling puts it there. OK, because firstly, you're competing with Microsoft Office, but then you're competing with Google Docs as well, which is like a whole other type of competition, because you've got a like, collaborative thing going on. Um, so the, the, w like the competition can come from unexpected um, sources. And then if we look at applications like Sakai and Opencast particularly, and um, mobile applications, these are sort of in the challenged strategy because of that desire for people to want to buy services rather than wanting to have and run software. And so it's not fundamentally around the features and the flexibility, or rather that's like a secondary consideration. It's first people want to run an RFP and they want a vendor to show up and they want to give them an annual cost and then to solve all their problems for them. So that makes it very difficult for open source to sort of be in exactly the same space and even to compare them against each other because they're in some ways like very, just very different types of things. Um, but what I'm interested in is what does it mean for open source to provide all of those things that we've come to expect from cloud-hosted services but still be open source that we are fundamentally in control of and that is ours rather than being locked into a vendor who has just sold us a service. So I think that the two models that are interesting here, so one is a sort of model where somebody else is providing the service but in a more collaborative or cooperative model. And an example here is Switch, which is a Swiss um, higher education consortium in, in a sense. I'm not sure it's exact legal structure, but it provides services to Swiss universities and provides infrastructure. So from the, the point of view of a Swiss university, you can use Opencast as if it were a cloud service because the cloud fundamentally is just somebody else's computers. Um, and you can install your own capture hardware and devices and then point it at the Swiss instance of Opencast and you're up and running. Um, and the next model, which I think is interesting, is, is saying that you know the cloud is used by commercial software as a service vendors to sell services to people, but we can just as easily use it ourselves to provide our own services. And there's some examples here that are interesting in the open cost space, and Harvard DCE did this first with an on-campus implementation of open cost that they moved to um, run in Amazon, basically for performance reasons and flexibility, because they had their own computing infrastructure, and they couldn't make that run as fast as the Amazon infrastructure. And so they moved it lock, stock, and barrel into Amazon, and suddenly everything got faster for them. Um, the University of Manchester is also planning a big migration, again, moving on-campus server systems into an Amazon environment. And I believe UNISA recently did this with Azure, which was quite an achievement. And congratulations to everyone who did that. Um, so again, um, you can do this. So what are some of the implications of deploying this? So an interesting one is you're essentially bypassing your local data center. Like, you don't need it anymore. You need some things, like authentication, probably, and some integration with other systems. But the actual data center and servers and things you don't need. And there's the, the potentially, you could be bypassing your IT staff, depending on whether your IT staff are repositioning themselves as cloud architecture specialists who can advise you 
or they just say, we run our data center, you go and run your applications in the cloud. But from the point of view of, of somebody wanting to provide teaching and learning applications, this sort of changes the dynamic within the university. Um, there's the potential for this to be much faster to deploy, more scalable, and probably higher performance. So even though we have a, what I think is a relatively good um, virtualized server infrastructure at UCT, we have storage system servers, so we can pretty much say, we need new servers, and these are the specs, and can you bring them up? And then they'll arrive like a day or two later. We'll get the servers. So that's fantastic, but we're sort of talking about days to minutes here. So in a cloud environment, you can like press the button and your cloud instances can be there immediately. Um, whether that's important or not is another question, but I think there's like, it's a, when you move from reading print books to reading on a e-reader or something like, you never go back, like, because you want the sequel and you've got it immediately, and the idea that you have to walk to a bookshop and buy it is old. Um, so I spoke earlier around having a global footprint is potentially faster response times for users, not only because that you're hosting in places which are better access to global networks, but also content distribution networks um, that you can leverage to be on your side and uh, be a bit more agile and responsive. Um, the big downside is that it's potentially more complex and also more costly in interesting and surprising ways. So. One of the things that goes along with this is, is containerization, and um, this is essentially an additional layer of virtualization. So we have physical servers, and then we have a VM environment, and then you put a container system in there, and then you have an application running on top of it. Um, and we're starting to see this as a something we should be doing more of because of basically dependency management. And it's interesting in open cost, um, is in some ways a more complex application than Sakai, even though it does relatively fewer things in the functional scope, but it uses a lot of different technologies to do those things around video processing and audio analysis and um, SCR and all of that. So containerization is sort of a response to this very dynamic, complex landscape and very many different requirements, but being able to orchestrate these things together in a way that is still slightly sane and agile. Um, so some of the questions is, if you look at the code base of systems that were designed in essentially a, a pre-cloud era, not that the cloud didn't exist, but there wasn't such a sort of cloud-first emphasis. They sort of built with some traditional assumptions around applications and how you deploy and maintain and run and upgrade them. So one of those is you have major version releases, for example, and every now and then you upgrade your software, and when you go from one version to another, there's quite a lot of work involved in that, including database upgrade scripts and stuff like that. Um, and I think we need to figure out how to build open software applications that do not require an upgrade step, that have no major versions in them. There are only ever tiny versions or something, and they change continuously, because that is sort of what we, the vision that we're being sold and got used to, like no one knows what version of Gmail you use. Like it's not even a concept. You, so you, people have sort of become used to things changing in continuous, small, subtle ways. Um, and the downsides to that, but uh, probably the, the upsides outweigh the downsides. But I think there's a, like a software engineering discipline that we need to figure out to be able to build our application to work like that. Um, <clears throat> Web-based, so packaging and containerization, and that's essentially that can we provide a whole application and packaged with a set of dependencies that is known to work so that your installation and getting a running step is not three pages, it's like one command, or maybe two commands that will do all of these things. Um, <clears throat> and people have gone some of the way with um, Sakai and OpenCast to do that. But one of the, the sort of missing links is to, uh, I think, line up the packaging and containerization with uh, a cloud native environment. So you think, right, here's the one command that will bring up your new OpenCast instance in an Amazon environment, for example. 
Um, Web-based configuration, again, we're very used to having lots of configuration files, and I think you should bring it up and point a browser at it and then tell it how you want it to work. Um, zero downtime upgrades and high availability again. So the, the high availability and the upgrades sort of go together because if you can cluster your services in such a way that there's no single point of failure, you can also do sort of rolling continuous upgrades. So you can do that to some degree with Sakai until you get to a, like a database schema change and then like you have to bring the whole thing down and change it and bring it all back up again. And the software just has to get smarter at being able to do that and notice changes. Um, so the two more important things probably are around the sort of workload and job management. And Opencast is again slightly more complex than Sakai in this way because it does two things. One is play videos back to students, which is quite predictable and understood as a workload. And the other is process videos, which can send your cluster from doing nothing at like 3 a.m. to being maxed out at 2 p.m. and then drop all the way back down again. So the point is not to have 50 servers sitting around waiting for the peak time. It's to scale up and down your servers as you need the capacity to meet some particular throughput goal that you have. Um, and <clears throat> that's, again, uh, like interesting from a cost management point of view. So there are efficiencies that we can get around learning how to do that well, but it's maybe hard to do well. And then the last point there is efficiency in that we're used to people writing inefficient code and just sort of sucking it up because you bought your server and whether it chugs away at like 90% utilization or 80% utilization doesn't make a difference to you. But if we put this into a cloud environment, potentially every single like execution is somehow going to translate into a bottom line around resources that we've used which ironically goes back to a sort of mainframe era where you paid per MIP. Like IBM made large amounts of money licensing mainframes and how much processing power you did on that. Um, so some of the management implications here, I think, is that essentially we're proposing that almost all of our IT costs around delivering these services at the infrastructure layer move from capital expenditure to operating expenditure. So instead of the university investing in millions in server racks and virtualization and storage systems and backup that we're instead paying a reasonably hefty bill every year, but it's a, a sort of an operating cost rather than investing in equipment that we own. But there are a lot of interesting questions that arises from that in universities, like whose budget that is and who has control over it. Um, a set of questions around how the risk landscape changes. So what does it mean for application availability? Um, you're not worried about your data center dying anymore, but if somebody does not pay your Amazon bill, then all your services go offline. Um, where is your data actually being hosted legally? Which jurisdictions can access your data without your knowledge and consent, privacy, ethics, compliance issues? And then a whole new set of skills required that is essentially around understanding how to deploy systems into these complex cloud environments. And this is an example from Manchester, some of their deployment planning for their open cost migration into Amazon. And what's interesting about it is it sort of spans this very wide range through from applications through to essential virtual network creation, load balancing, a whole bunch of things. So it's taking skill sets that would have been traditionally into a data center IT systems networks environment and sort of asking us to pack all that into um, like a cloud architect developer skill set because you're not creating these things in real life anymore, you're bringing them into being virtually by having written a set of configuration files and then pressing a button. So I sort of think that might make it even harder to hire the right skills to get this done, but it's an interesting challenge. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So one of the interesting things here is that like, if we get the efficiency performance stuff wrong, again, it used to be our users were unhappy, but now it might be that, like, we blow our budget in January and then we have no budget to run our service for the rest of the year. 
Uh, and this moving from fixed to variable costing could have a lot of interesting implications. So it might be that we want to do something new, but someone figures out the computing cost is too high and you get told you can't do it because it will use up too much processing time or something. And that's potentially undesirable because there's a lot of innovation that we want to be able to do and you want to try things out sometimes just to see what will happen. So if this sort of sense of we now have to pay our Amazon bill and you're responsible for keeping it as low as possible could sort of send us in a direction that we don't want to go where we're reluctant to do new things or to do something that requires more computing capacity because some of these bills will go up. Um, and then complexity, I think, you know, to, to offer, we're sort of selling a different pitch to people. We're saying you don't have to go to a vendor who will sell you something and then you lose all control over it. Here is a system, you can sign up with a cloud vendor, you pay the bill and it's your system but running in the cloud. Um, it's a different pitch, but it comes with sort of some complexity and we need to figure out if that's a manageable and attractive proposition um, for organizations that is strong enough to keep them out of the path of paying a lot of money to someone else to take away control over their own systems. Uh, and I'm sort of out of time. One minute. One minute. Okay. One minute, one question. Or you can talk to me later at the cocktail. support of Equela. So Open Equela is also um, is an institutional repository. Uh, we are very excited to have you online with us. Thank you, Franz, for, for joining us as well. Chris, would you mind introducing Franz when you start? And then it's all over to you. Thank you so much. All right, and there'll be a slide on that in just a minute, so we'll, we'll do that in time. 
All right, so welcome to the Open Aquila uh, presentation for Aero Africa 2019. For our agenda today, we're going to go through some introductions, and we'll talk about a brief history of the application, and we'll give an Open Aquila demo uh, just to get folks a little bit of comfort with some of the basic functionality. And then we're going to go into a section called what we're calling the mini faces of Open Aquila. Uh, Open Aquila is highly customizable. Uh, used around the globe, and so we're going to be sh uh, talking about a university in the U.S., and then another one in Australia, and another one in the Europe region. And then we'll have time for any questions. That so for today, as um, as is already mentioned, my name is Chris Beach. I am a, the Unicon Open Aquila Tech Lead and a software developer at Unicon, um, mostly focused on open source software. So my name is Franz Uwe and I'm an Equella consultant for around 10 years, uh, working now for Next Education Services and I was engaged in e-learning for over 20 years. We do cover the area of Europe, Middle East, Africa and I was working on uh, Equella installations like, uh, for instance, in UK, University of Nottingham, this also comes in China and Asia. Island, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, where we were synchro synchronizing several equator and e-learning systems on site. Also in Singapore, South Korea. I've also been in Johannesburg uh, setting up equator for MGI. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So, in terms of the history of opening. <laughs> Spring Edge application was developed through the Department of Education of Tasmania and by a company called Ditech Solutions. A year later, the Tasmania DOE agreed for Ditech to maintain the, the rights to the TLE application, and the company, the Learning Edge International, was formed. Four years later, the application was rebranded to Aquella, and then three years later, Pearson acquired Aquella and the subsidiary companies that were supporting it. For the next four years, Pearson expanded Aquila, and then in 2016, uh, Pearson internal strategy shifted, and in 2017, Pearson open sourced Aquila through the Aperio Foundation, and it was rebranded as Open Aquila. In 2018, so just last year, Open Aquila graduated from the Aperio incubation process. But as a note, from um, from the folks that have been working with Aquila for years and years as a commercial product, um, as the Pearson strategy shifted, some of the folks were able to then either create their own companies or go to consulting companies um, that are able to then provide um, open Aquila consulting expertise. Right? So you hear about you know what is what is Unicon's role in this or Edelax as their next education services. We are companies that have open Aquila expertise. Um, but since it is an open um, source product, then you know, anyone is able to then gain that expertise as well. So let's go ahead and jump into a demo of open Aquila. So we'll go ahead and log in. What you're presented with when you first log into Aquila is the dashboard screen. This is um, this is customizable. Pretty much anything you see in Open Aquila is customizable. So we built this welcome portlet uh, with these infographics to to help facilitate this demo. But you can really put anything you want here. On the left hand side is all of the all of the actions that this user has the permissions to see or to do. Right, so I can go ahead as this user. I can search. I can contribute. Um, I can look at you know, my favorite items or searches. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that I could do that we don't have time to talk about in this demo. What we want to get across is that Open Aquila um, can work well inside of the educational environment as your content management system and as like a content hub. Um, you can, since Open Aquila is so customizable and you can script it um, pretty much however you need it to be, you can 
you can do things that make it more, you know, that expand its abilities beyond the content management system, or you don't have to use it. It's a part of it, and that's fine too. Um, but it, it integrates with authentication modules, with other repositories, it integrates with other content providers such as YouTube and Flickr, and then it also integrates with your presentation layer applications such as LMSs, D2L, Moodle, um, Uportal, which is another Aperio product, um, and Open Aquila um, is, can become a, you know, a useful component to manage your content and then share it out to um, all the places that your institution needs it. So before we go ahead and look at how to contribute and search for content, it's important to understand how Open Aquila stores content. An Open Aquila institution, and that's what we're in right now. So if you look, we have a URL, right? Aquila.unicom.net slash demo. That's our institution URL. You can have multiple institutions on a given Aquila install if you so choose, so it's multi-tenancy. And inside a given institution, you then have these things called schemas. Schemas are metadata templates that will help drive how your data is stored. Uh, schemas can be standardized to LOM or Dublin Core or what have you, and they can also be customized. It's completely based on how you want to set up your institution. Then at the next level, you have a collection. A collection takes this schema template and then defines how a user is going to um, fill in values to that schema and then also how it will be presented to the user and displayed. A collection will also define how the permissioning around what users can do with content that um, is owned by that collection. And then when we really get down to what we're, we're really interested in, the resources are the items, right? So a given resource that is key to a collection, which is then based off of a schema template. And that resource can contain content, and it will contain metadata. That metadata is based off of the inputs that they provided um, in the collection wizard, and then it got merged in with the schema template to create kind of a copy of that template um, for that given resource. So let's go ahead and contribute a piece of content. So when we click on contribute, what we're presented with, these are all of the collections that we have the permissions to contribute to. So we'll go ahead and contribute a running resource. Again, just like the dashboard page, anything that you see here is customizable. We've set up a simple widget here to, you know, just to give what is the name of this learning resource. Other widgets can provide different kinds of values. So in this case, it is a, an HTML editor with TinyMCE. And then we'll go ahead and make that so we're showing that the HTML will be able to come through. And then let's go ahead and add a piece of content. There's various ways that you can um, attach content in OpenFlow. You can do just a basic file, which we'll be doing today, but you can also do links. And some of these links can have uh, integration wrappers around them, such as Google Books, YouTube, and Flickr, to make the user experience that much more friendly. Instead of having to cut and paste a link in Google Books, you can just use the search interface inside of OpenFlow to find the Google Book you want to integrate with. In this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to upload a file. And we'll just choose this image. Aquila can handle any content type. Right? And it's configurable if you want to ban certain content types based on your institutional needs. Um, but as a default, you can put anything you want to know. Collection wizards also have the, have the ability to support scripting. Um, and that will create a much more rich and dynamic user experience. So let's say that I was, um, I, you know, I wanted to create some supporting attachments, right? So this is set up as, it also keys off of my metadata, but the wizard is watching this metadata and saying, well, when this, you know, enable supporting attachments is 
is present in the metadata, now I need to show another widget of these supporting attachments, and this, it happens to be another attachment control. And likewise, you can also say, well, if enable details, if that piece of metadata is filled in, then I want to go ahead and show another, another page in the wizard, which then has itself a bunch of other metadata that we can fill in. And we'll go ahead and just select that this, this language is, is in French for some reason. Okay. And it will be more interesting if we go ahead and put this and then add, so we're going to be doing keyword searches and we'll show that to do that as well. So we have a keyword um, here, right, as this widget's going to be indexed for keyword searching. And then in the details page, we're also going to be setting a piece of metadata um, for the value of French, and we'll see the difference between them. We'll go ahead and save this item. And now what we're presented with is a resource summary page or an item summary page, as, as it might be called. Our, our metadata is now showing up, right? It is displayed in the way that we defined it by the collection. So you wouldn't have to set it up this way. I've seen it set up in terms of tabs. Um, you can set it up so a, maybe a student can see a smaller amount of the metadata, while a teacher can see more of it, and then a system admin can see a lot more of the metadata, right? It's, it's all based on permissions and scripting, um, how you want to set up these, these summary papers. You can go ahead and access your attachment if you want to. And then you have the ability to do various actions against this item, right? If you want to go ahead and edit it, you can. It drops you back into that same wizard. You can go ahead and redraft it if you want to, move it to a different collection. There's lots of abilities you can do. Before we go ahead and look at searching, I just wanted to show the back door of what an item looks like. So we go into what's known as the tilde view, and here we have our XML um, uh, metadata that we'll see in a minute. But then we also have our image, right? And notice that this thumbs folder, this thumbs folder we didn't upload. Aquella created it but it created it in the content space for the item, and so now it shows up here. So this view can show you everything that's associated with your item. For the XML view, this shows us what metadata is associated with this particular item. So everything under the, the item node, that is system-generated metadata. But everything here, right, that's highlighted at the top, this was part of our schema. If you'll remember back to the infographic for that schema template, and the long general title, right, that was part of the, the schema. And then when, um, in the collection, when we created, when we, when we specified demo item dash French, then the collection knew to put that value inside of the title node, and it brought it together, and now that is the item. XML that we can then use to do scripting, permissioning, um, and you know a bunch of other fun things inside of Open So let's go ahead and back out now. In order to do searching, while the demo sysadmin user can do that, it'll be a little more interesting if we log in as a different user. So let's go ahead and log in as a student. Now, a student generally will have less permissions in Open Aquila than, say, an administrator, right? So if you see, if you um, remember back to the, uh, the system admin we were just in, there's a bunch of other abilities here, like manage external resources, manage resources and settings. The users don't, this user doesn't have permissions to do that. They also don't have permissions to create any content. And again, this is configurable, so you can say, well, a student has the ability to create content in maybe you know, the student work collection, create something like that, and then uh, they would have a contribute button here. We have set up the portlet to be shown for all users, so when you, when you log in, you're able to see the infographics um, as a student as well as an app. But we want to go ahead and search for our contents. So our, our teacher said they just added a picture out there for our course, we need to go and take a look at it. So it showed up here just in the default search. Right? If we wanted to do a keyword search, we could search for, say, something like math, and resources would show up. 
when we wanted to search for um, this keyword French, right? And it highlights it for us to say this is what I was found. Another way that you can search is by collection, right? So if you wanted to just see everything that was a learning resource, you could go ahead and do that. And you want to dig deeper, you have this ability to do what's called an advanced search, which really is your targeting metadata. Okay? So here we're saying that based on the metadata tag of, um, uh, you know, that's, that's specified for language, uh, we want to return any results that are key to French. Okay? And so I get back ours, that was um, because we set, uh, associated that. We also get back this other one about the Eiffel Tower. You can see here in the query that's created, this is a very simple query. Advanced searches can get fairly complex. Um, but it is doing a, a simplified X path based on that metadata XML that we saw earlier when we went um, and just inspected the item we created. And it's just it's searching for any of the X paths, this, this X path that equals the French value. So, so that's one way that we can search for the item that we, um, that we created. If we go ahead and look at that item here, notice that the, that the summary page looks very similar. All of our metadata is still here. We can go ahead and access the item just fine, but none of our actions are showing up, and that's because we didn't provide permissions to this user to do so. And so administrators of OpenCola have a wide range of abilities to, to create granular permission sets um, based on whatever institutional needs you have. Now, in terms of integration, we'll go back to that infographic and look, right? Um, we've been only inside of OpenAquila for this demo. But, right, but now we want to go ahead and go into an LMS. So we have a sandbox for D2L or Brightspace. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to pull in the content we just created in OpenAquila. We're going to pull it into D2L. So we're here in the Brightspace sandbox, and we're in one of our modules called Introduction, and we're going to go ahead and open up what's known as an Open Aquila selection session. All right, and so at the selection session, let's go ahead and search for the item we created, so for demo. Okay, and several come up, and that's fine. We're going to expand our item because what we're trying to do is we're trying to integrate the, the image. You could also integrate it at the item summary page if you want to. And we'll go ahead and return that selection. All right, and so now a reference to that content has been made inside of Brightspace, but the content has not actually been copied. We want to go ahead and access it and look at it. We can, right? So it shows up. It looks like the content is in the LMS, but really it's stored in OpenAquila. Now let's say that this was really maybe a logo that we were doing, right? And we wanted to, uh, we needed to make a change to it. And so if we go back as demo sysadmin. Let's go find that piece of content that we contributed. And let's edit it. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace this image with a different image. Right? So this would be like, well, this is our logo, but now, you know, this image of fruit is now our logo. I'm going to save that. Okay, so now that piece of content is, well, let's, let's start with the first. Okay, so the thumbnail is still being generated, um, but our piece of content is now showing up as, um, as something totally different. We go back to Brightspace, okay, now the name didn't change because that was part of the integration. If we actually want to see the content, Would happen that would <laughs> it, it worked right the correct way yesterday. Let's try this one more time. Well, that 
is just unfortunate. That's the way it's supposed to work. So then you'd call in support and you'd ask why that's not working. But what was supposed to happen is that image would just show up and you don't have to do a reintegration. You don't have to go back in here, you know, and delete the content and re-upload the content. It should just show up here. Going back to the dashboard, right? So we saw one way you can integrate. There's lots of other different ways you can integrate into the presentation layers. Um, we saw where you could integrate with Google Books um, or YouTube if you want to. Um, and all of these, since it's open source, if you have a presentation layer application, which are, it would be really cool if Open and Public used this LMS, maybe Sakai or a different LMS, that's doable, right? These integrations are done mostly with LTI. And so you just create a um, essentially a, a module or enhance the code in Open Quilla, and then you have that that tight integration with Open Quilla, as well as these other um, attack pieces of or these uh, providers of content. Uh, you could create something else um, to join this family, and then use it to integrate with your attachments. As another note, uh, just kind of to finish up the demo inside of your institution you can have workflows that can be associated with one or more collections. Uh, workflows allows us to moderate content, uh, so you can have a, a curated set of content. It can be by collection, or you can moderate all of your content um, in, your, in your institution. Institutions also have its own set of user management rules, security, um, and settings. And so when you're in your institution, it's kind of your own little world that you can find whatever business processes you need. All right, so now we want to get into the, the portion of the, uh, the presentation about the many faces of Open and Quella. Um, we saw just a very vanilla, basic view of what Open and Quella can do in the demo. Um, but now we're going to take a look at what adopters have done with Open And the first uh, adopter that we're going to go ahead and look at is BYU Idaho. And BYU Idaho is a university in the United States. Right? And so they, they branded the, um, the Open Quilla interface, but it's still, you can still tell that it's mostly, uh, it's pretty easy to tell that it's, it's a Quilla. Um, they were, BYU Idaho was looking for a content management system that could do lots of different things for them. They had a various amounts of digital collections that were being stored in, uh, you know, in box and um, on file systems. And, you know, it was just a plethora of places inside of their university. And they wanted to gather it all together. They wanted to make it accessible. They wanted it to be ensure that the, the correct copyright and permissions were being set on it. Um, and as they were searching for you know, what content management system could, could do all of this, Aquila fit the bill for, um, for a large portion of it. And so they decided to go ahead and use it. One example of the collections that they were able to bring over um, is that they are storing uh, cuneiform um, images inside of Open Aquila or inside of the quality. And so you have metadata around you know, whatever these cuneiform images are, and then they went ahead and they store the actual images. Now note that it's not just one, right? I mean, you can have multiple files inside of one open Aquila item, and that's, you know, that's new. So I saved these searches, that's why I'm going back here. Uh, the other, another use case that they set up um, you know, to help increase adoption. Uh, folks, you know, they didn't, they didn't know anything about Aquila before, um, before the, the technology consultants inside of BYUI brought in, you know, and showed them what Open Aquila or Aquila was. Um, and so they needed to help um, ease the transition and also say, you know, what processes is BYUI faculty using that Open Aquila can work with instead of you know forcing the faculty to do something completely different? So they created a collection where faculty members can go in and they can add um, their um, their various pieces of content that then they can integrate with an LMS um, and and then expose to their students. 
And so in this case, they created a, uh, they created a website, um, and then they uploaded all of those files into a, a, an item inside of Aquila. And then the students can go and they can see essentially the, you know, this is the website for that, for that course. But it's all hosted, if you will, inside of this form. And while there's a lot of information out here on the um, you know, in that in that kind of mini website, if you will, that HTML file, there's still the metadata surrounding um, this item, so you can go ahead and find it if you want to. We've also seen where um, in a different university where the metadata was used to create the syllabus. So a user would go through and they would go through the contribution wizard, um, like we saw in the demo, and then when you click save. The, there's a scripting backend that would then be engaged and creates a PDF um, based on all the metadata you just put in. And the last one that I wanted to show for now is a music inventory. Right? So this was maybe not a need that they had, um, you know, they didn't have it necessarily in a digital collection at first, but they found another use for open color. This is not what you generally think of when you think of like a learning object repository. You're not going to use this uh, necessarily in a course where you integrate into, um, into your LMS and it would show a syllabus or you know, watch this video, but they're using it as an inventory tool so you can you can say, you know, what is its call number? You know, you can search for all the woodwinds that you have an inventory of, and then you can, um, you know, you can take pictures of the um, the image or the, the instruments every time they get returned, and you can see, you know, did the image get wear and tear and whatnot. Just one example of how you know you start to break away from just the standard learning object repository and say, what can I do when I have a system that can I can define the metadata, I can define how the content is set up, and I can define how the user experiences that data. And I will now hand it over to Franz to talk about our next university. Thanks, Chris, for the uh, good view of the Quetta from the technical side and some examples. Mm -hmm. So, I want to show you uh, the Open Aquila installation at Swinburne first, and after that, the installation in UK of Oxford Brooks. So, in that case, I will start. So Swinburne is located in Sydney, Australia, and the Aquila there went live in 2014. And uh, they created two openly accessible institutions. One of them was the Swinburne Commons collections, where they mostly have video audio images inside. Um, you would get a PowerPoint, and then you have also the link where you can see how they set it up because it's open. Swinburne, then furthermore, we have the Swinburne Research Bank uh, with the publications inside. And the main focus is uh, the open access, video, audio, images, and also the, the layout, the graphical user interface and the easy usability so that the students can get to their content without much hassle and clicks. Furthermore, of course, as this is a university installation, there needs to be compliant to, uh, to have the compliance and accessibility standards for uh, the system and also for some of the content. So let me show you short introduction video of the Swinburne University. Tumo Commons is a centralized service for the management and distribution of digital media at Tumo University. 
Over the last five years, our team has developed a customised platform for hosting member images, video and audio items. The range of content we publish include lectures and presentations, recordings of swimmer graduation ceremonies, videos about the university, as well as collections of video tutorials and other teaching materials. Our streaming video player will automatically present the optimal playback version, depending on the user's connection speed and device. You may also be able to download a copy of the file or use the embed code to place the video player directly into a web resource, such as the Swimmer website or the learning management system. Our Open to the World content is searchable by Google and is also distributed to our YouTube and our iTunes channels. Swimmer teachers can access our restricted content collection by logging in with their Swimmer username and password. We can also help Swimmer staff comply with accessibility requirements, maintaining video transcripts and captions at a low cost. This is now a requirement for all video items that are made available on the Swimmer University website. If you have any questions about the Swimmer Common Service, please get in touch with us at commons at swimmer.edu.au. So, thank you for watching. So, as you can see, they have a very good setup, also some kind of speech um, transcription, and furthermore, inside their system that shows how open a query is in the case of interfaces and other systems. So, the, the next installation I want to show you is the installation of Oxford Brooks in uh, Oxford, UK. They open the system. They do have their public side, the front side, which is available for all the people. As you can see, I am guest now, and this is the content that is public available. They have different collections, like the Oxford Brooks Research Collection, which is some kind of a full text archive uh, of all their publications, all thought by the inside researchers at Oxford Brooks University. Furthermore, there's also, of course, the Student Research Collection, where the students have their own produced documents and papers uh, that up and made public for people. And there is also the learning and teaching collection that supports the internal stuff and the students when they want to make some lectures, <coughs> graphics, documents, they have rules, help, and also pictures inside to show up. Them. And even more, there are special collections and archives like uh, Dorset House Archive and whatever. So let's go back and go for the Oxford Brooks Research Collection by clicking, and you'll see. Uh, that we have staff publications, it is locked here because they're not public. And we have, for example, research data. <coughs> here you can see they're pretty active. So that's another picture here. And in that case, we do have a lot of videos, the research data uploaded and freely accessible in that case. However, let me show how they implemented the items of this collection. This is an example item of Dr. Peter Basket. Uh, we do have the metadata over here. We also do have the public link for the UI permanent link to this resource. This is visible here. And as you can see here, we do have 
different attachments like the video itself and also the interactive transcript they are using. This means if you click on this, it shows up the video, loads the video, and as you can see below, there are different buttons where I can jump to the bookmarks in the video, to your favorite sequences, or what needs to be improved, etc. This shows how flexible this kind of uh, the content can be based into a quella. And what you can do with the item summary page and the resources over there. If I go back on the radar home page for the Kali installation, we do also have some learning and teaching materials. And one example of usage could be that we that you need to have graphics for the teaching materials and these graphics maybe should not be too different. They should have their own style or whatever. An example is here that they are providing cartoons by Bob Humphrey. So in that case the lecturers can easily use, reuse or ask for more items to keep up the teaching content. So another place or another method of showing content inside is one extract. This is a 20 second video. So here you see the Oxford Brooks page and how even three-dimensional graphics can be embedded. So as you can see there's also the option that different integrations can show up on the item summary page. So, another part which is interesting on the Foxford Brooks research, the Foxford Brooks homepage, is that we do have the learning and teaching part, and especially here we also do have the past examination papers. Click on it, so then the students have the ability to more easily do their learning and preparing for the next exam. However, as you can see here, the attachments are locked. So you do need a staff or student demo to get to the content finally, which is one of the big advantages of the Quella, because uh, the producer, contributor, does own his own content and he can choose if this content is available only for you one year or can be clicked or used for 50 times or only in December or whatever. So the contributor or creator of the content uh, has inside the kernel um, the option to decide what will happen with this content. Okay, so in that case, I guess I will also hand over again to Chris for the next things. All right, go ahead, yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen for a second, for us. So you can grab it, let's try. There. Okay, thanks. All right, and before I continue, it just bugged me that um, <laughs> that this integration didn't work. Um, just for folks' um, you know, information, I had integrated on the wrong resource, right? So there was a demo 
item here, and we were working on this one, um, but this is the one I actually integrated, and so it did show up then in tie-in. And the, the thing to just show was that you know it was referencing it was referencing something in open quality, it wasn't actually a copy of it. All right, so <clears throat> the key takeaways that we hope you get out of um, out of this presentation. Open Aquila integrates well with other um, with other applications, open source and, and closed source. Um, so when you, when you look at is Open Aquila a good fit for my um, my university or, or institution, um, you need to take a look at the other applications that are being used and you know, does it work with LTI or OAuth or Shared Secrets and how can Open Close and talk with them? Because if you have a content hub that can't talk with anything, it's not all that useful. Open Equal is highly configurable, um, but it goes to a point. And if and once that point gets hit, then you can start customizing Open Equal. And there are there are ways to do that inside, you know, um, this that the user is kind of guided on where to customize Open Equal. Once that customization then reaches that point where you know it's just you, know, you need to go to the next level, but the the customization hooks are no longer working for you. Open Aquila provides a, a scripting API, and you can do a lot more, um, you know, a lot more business processes inside of that those scripts. Um, it also presents a REST API for you. So if you want to run Open Aquila in essentially a headless mode, and you're just making REST calls uh, to for it to manage your content, and then you want to do all of your presentation. Um, and all of your UI work in, say, uPortal or Sakai or what have you, um, you would be able to use the REST APIs in order to still take advantage of the power of Open Aquila, but essentially completely skin it um, to have a different UI. And Open Aquila does not tie you to a specific metadata schema. In fact, it doesn't even tell you which one to use or recommend one. It, it provides the ability for you to create whatever you want in there. Um, you can set it up to be a standard, or you can have it be customized. There's, you know, it's, it just wasn't able really to be part of the demo due to time. But you can you can specify import transform, so you can receive data in say Dublin Core, and you can store it in your in your special your, your custom schemas, and then they provide export transform, so you could then take that same data that was in Dublin Core, be converted to your custom schema. And then, if you want to export your content to a to a different uh, system, you could actually export it as a loan, right? And it's all just based on how you want to define your schemas and your transforms. Open Aquila makes use of granular permissions and access controls. So, like Franz was showing um, when that student had to log in, they had the ability to go to a certain point in the in the in looking at that item. But when they got to a point where you, know, you actually had to see content and that was protected content, then they, uh, the system understood that and presented a link instead of you know, what we saw in the demo where you just didn't have the actions on the right hand side. So there's ways to guide the user as well with, with permissions. So permissions can work closely with the scripting to create a really immersive environment for the user. And then there's there's a variety of ways to meet what you as you know your you know uh, trying to set up how the technology needs of the institution needs to be addressed. And so we saw a few universities today. There's there's quite a bit more that have implemented Open Aquila or Aquila uh, to meet their business needs that can be totally different from a different institution. And you're able to use Open Quality because it's configurable, customizable, and straight. So, if Open Aquila is interesting to you, if you want to know more about it, if you want to get involved in the community, uh, the, we put some links out here to um, to help get you started. All right. So, there's the Aperio Open Aquila website uh, that has kind of some of the initial information. Um, Google Groups, we have a developers um, group as well as a users group, so um, consider jumping on one of those, subscribing to it. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but the other um, fairly active one um, way to get involved in the community is, is our GitHub site. 
So it's being transferred. Um, we're, we're in discussions on how to do that to transfer to the Git, the Aperio project in GitHub. Um, but this link is still working. It just moved you over once we, once we do switch to the Aperio project. Um, but if you see an issue or you want to know a little bit more about Aquila or you want to go grab a demo um, installer of Aquila and you know, install it on your system and just take a look yourself, uh, you can find it all there at the, at the Aquila repository. And with that, we uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to listen to us. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Chris. Examples. Uh, that was really great. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, from Vienna. Um, no, so Franz was joining us from Vienna um, in Austria. So, um, Michael, do you want to introduce the new the university? Okay, so to okay. yeah, So we're going to have the short sessions um, where the institutions give us some feedback on what they've done. So it will be Gert uh, Sibanga this, this afternoon, as well as Yulisa, and then Vitz as well. They are not on the list, uh, but they also want to share some things with us. Good afternoon to each and every one of you, and thank you for being here still. <laughs> it's, it's, it's late in the day, it's been a long day, but thank you so much um, for being here. And I want to say th uh, welcome to Hartse Bandi College. It's, it, it, uh, it is so that uh, Hartse Bandi College is the only <laughs> Tibet College uh, with Sakai and uh, all the other institutions here are its universities um, and also the universities have a history of using LMSA and having students online and distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While the Tibet College, the whole sector, it is actually a new thing. Okay, so, but just um, before I go to the LMS and the, the everything there, I do want to say one or two words about the college. Um, for the reason, and for those of you who saw it last year, forgive me, 
but a lot of you haven't seen it. So I've just repeated one or two of the slides so that you can get the full picture of, of the, the college sector and particularly Hartsebandi College and uh, where we fit in, in the picture. Right, so um, I'm going to just quickly show you where we are in Pumalanga. There are 50 Tibet colleges in South Africa. And in Pumalanga, Khatsabandi is one of three colleges. So we have Itlan Zeni more in the Nelspreit area, and then in Kangala is Whitbank Middleburg. And then Khatsabandi, we have our head office in Standerton. And myself, I'm based in Ermelua. So you can see we have like six, um, there's one or two that's not indicated here, new ones. Pardekop, that is a very rural one, as well as the one you see there, Sibanusechu. Uh, it is on the border with Swazi. It's very rural area there and forever struggling with connectivity. But, um, oh, here is Pardekop. I see it is indicated there as well. Right, so those are the, the sites that we have in Khartsabandi College. The reason why we started in um, 2007 with Sakai was for the staff. So you see I have staff portal and student portal. The staff portal was the initial need that we had. We, we, because of this six sites that is so far away from, from each other, it was very, it was a huge need that we had in the college to find a way of standardizing uh, assessments, etc. And so we built a staff portal where we can, which we basically use as a management system, content management for assessments mainly. So that, that was the initial start of Sakai at the college. And then it actually, um, it was now well uh, established and well developed and then we realized that we need to move into a new dimension. And there is a need for students as well. So only like two years back, we decided let's start with a student portal. Now, because the programs in the college is so different from universities, I just quickly want to give you this background. We don't have degrees and diplomas and those things that you have in your universities. We are still running the very, very old NATED programs. Some of you might even remember from 19 foot sack, we still have in one, two, three, four, five, six. And then um, from, I think it was just in 1995 somewhere, um, the NCV, the vocational programs, have been introduced. Now, the vocational programs, because of the very practical nature and a huge practical component that's inside of those um, programs. It is very, very difficult to do something like distance um, or anything off-site or anything like not face-to-face. -face. So, and also here we are hampered by a lot of policies. I am forever um, battling and trying to get through to the policymakers. In fact, 
um, I chose that as I'm currently busy with my masters and I chose that to be my, my topic and I want to go sit and interview the people um, who make the policies because in the NCV there is a requirement the ICAS policy says 80% class attendance. So how does that cater for open learning? And the assessment policy says all assessments under controlled circumstances. So how does that cater for open learning if you can't even have an online assessment? So those are things that's in the TVET policies that, that, that's hampering um, open learning at, at large. But then on the NATED side, that's a lot more theoretical. And then for, for those, there is a bit of a, a space for us to put initiatives in place whereby we can do some online learning. So you won't believe it, but this January, we have in fact started doing exactly what Yunisa and everyone else have been doing for all these years. And that is to say, the distance, which in, in the past had been distance program, we've been doing distance for 10 years, but it was a manual distance. A student must physically come and drop off his assignment. So for, from this January, we have started with online. And only one program we're piloting, but I'm, I'm very proud of that, that we could actually start to say, we are going to facilitate online learning and the student can actually use a scanner and put the assignment in the Dropbox and, the, and they don't have to come to campus and everything is done manually anymore. So to, to us, this is a, a huge achievement. So there is the native, let me run through this. I have spoke already about those and then Um, this is just a staff portal. I'm not going to talk about this uh, in more depth. This is the student portal, and I'm not going to log in live. I am just quickly going through a few of screenshots just to save time here as well. The other achievement that we, that I really feel like I, I'm proud of is the integration that we did with our call tech system. I don't know if any of you know about call tech, but that's the administrative system that we have. Um, so we felt that there's a need for students to see some of the information, of their personal information, like their, what, what is the financial status, what are my marks, and those kind of things that is on Cortec. They have a right to see that, and we wanted to make that available through the portal for them as well. So we had a, a integration, the developers um, of Cortec came, and we sat and we saw how can we integrate the two systems so now we have that as well. So we very, and it goes along with the online um, registration system as well, which happens through Cortec. So now we, we have that available as well. Okay, so there is the, the NSFAS details, the financial details of a student. He can log in and see that and then exam dates. The moment that DHET has um, released the, the national exam dates, it is on the Cortex system and for, for that reason also integrated in Kapula and the student can just log in and he can see his exam dates. He doesn't have to 
come to campus anymore and get a printout with its exam date. So all of this is um, <clears throat> it's an improvement for us. And then exam results automatically. As DHET released the exam results, it's automatically updated on the system. The student can see it at home. You won't believe it, but we are that far back that up till end of last year, a student had to come to campus and get a stand in a queue and get a print out with his exam results. And now we've put it online. So we're really very, very uh, proud of that. This is just a few uh, screenshots of the online. So entrepreneurship in four, for instance, there is the modules that they study. Sorry, this is not student view. This is now my view. Um, there is some interactive uh, little quizzes and things that he can take, uh, important dates and some communication from the lecturer there. So just in a nutshell, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, we are making slow progress, but we are going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Testing one, two. Testing. Testing. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> getting working. <laughs> okay. Hi, good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for the opportunity for us to do a presentation. Um, my name is Ms. Charlotte Kay, and this is... Sinead Dyson. <laughs> okay. So I represent the teaching and learning community in UNISA, so I represent the colleges and the user side, and uh, Sinead represents ICT, so... They work on the on the back end. Um, yeah, at least it, it gives me a great honor. The last time I was at the conference last year, I presented with Martali and Arlo, and we had a long to-do list about the kinds of, you know, we had a wish list about the things that we wanted to do, and we were ambitious and dreaming about the kinds of things that we wanted to do. But at least today, I can proudly say, uh, with ICT and with the help of Open Collab, thanks to the, the, the Open Collab team, that we've managed to achieve quite a few of those goals. Um, with great frustration on the part of academics who don't want the change, you know, they're very comfortable, but uh, we're going to try and work on the risk appetite um, because they need to understand that the space is starting and beginning to occupy that we need to keep ourselves adaptable, flexible, all these beautiful buzzwords that we use, they need to get on board with us. So just from our perspective, um, I'm just going to quickly... So last year when I stood with Martelian, we, we, we talked quite about, about the kinds of things we'd like to do. So one of the things was we needed to do an upgrade because we were still running on 10.5 and we just couldn't get moving. And with the help and advice and the advice of, of Open Collab, um, you know, going through our tool list, looking at our, our institution, our context, 
the advice um, was we need to look a little bit more closely, you know, to, to Sakai, to vanilla, and moving that direction because in that way we allow ourselves to be a lot more adaptable, flexible, and that when there are changes within the community, then we can adapt accordingly as well. Um, but if we continue to go and change the tools to the extent that we have in the past, it makes it very difficult for us then to keep up with the rest of, of the globe. So that was one of the things that we managed to do was then we then managed last year to do the upgrade. Then more significantly for, for us now and more recently, um, around March, uh, the weekend, the long weekend of the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, we then unbundled in an attempt to go closer to Vanilla Sakai. And what we then did was we teased out our teaching and learning functions from our administrative tools. Um, I think last year when we did the, not last year or the year before, I think when we did the audit with Open Collab, I think we, we got to a list of like 107 tools or something. And most of those were administrative, believe me. Um, and that is how complex our beast is. We do more, more admin than we do teaching and learning. And that was actually frightening to understand by the list of tools that we have. So we also battled last year. We had to say, okay, we need to, we need to give our LMS a name. Everybody has interesting names. You know, we have Vula, we have all these nice names. So what about us? And going to and fro with academics, we then decided, okay, we've got my niece, so why don't we keep, you know, the, 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 the naming convention and let's go with my modules. And so now our teaching and learning side is now known as my modules. All our administrative tools, we've then plunked into my admin. Um, both of them are, are Sakai driven. However, the nice part for us is now that we've actually taken our my modules and we've moved into the cloud. And the my admin we still run locally. I'm going to hand over to, to, to Sunet. She'll speak to the next two, three slides and then I'll take over from there. Okay. Okay, so just some more about the move to the cloud. We were about a team of 23 people who worked on that project with Open Collab and also with Microsoft. You know, it was a big team because it was firewall changes, server changes, AD changes, development changes. It was quite a big project. In this process, we also moved from Oracle to MySQL, which um, for our local tools, we had to make changes to the actual code to, um, to use MySQL. And Open Collab did a data migration for us. I think it took 24 to 36 hours to migrate all the data. We also... Um, um, change to CAS that we've got single sign-on. They just have one sign-on and then they can either go to my modules or my admin. Now the my modules, um, the old my Unisa used to run on 30 nodes. We're now running on 15 nodes. Um, we're using a cluster file system, a F5 load balancer, the curry database pooling. Our login was also changed to be um, more standard Sakai. And um, we're using middleware to handle the linking of students and lecturers to Sakai. Um, on the My modules, we're mostly using Sakai to, um, tools. There are some UNISA local tools that remain, like we've got a welcome tool, the discussion forums, and also prescribed books. On My Admin, there were 30 admin tools that were running on My, my UNISA that was now moved to the My Admin port and 11 admin tools for students that was moved from my UNISA to my admin. Some of the my admin is still running on our old Sakai, not on the cloud, on the original Sakai, and then Open Collab also redeveloped some of these tools for us in a spring framework, I think. Some of the tools that remained in my admin is, or is now in my, my admin is maintain staff, the assignment submission, it's actually running on both, but it's just a link. It's actually running locally, but it's on my modules as well. The authorization structures, my life email support, and some more. Okay. And then just to give you a, a bit of a view of what, what we look like now. So this is this would be post login. Um, so if you go to my UNISA 
um, and you go and log in, then the two tabs on top. And, and what we were looking at in terms of our way forward, well, I don't want to jump the gun, but ideally also we would like to link our students to their research as well. So if they postgraduate students, then the idea would be to have a tab there that says my research and they will, uh, they will click and then they will link up to the Office 365 package. I think that is what is intended. And for now, we're still running the email outside of this. Um, the email is also running. Have we? Okay, so we've also run that out of the cloud. So that's currently what we're looking like. Okay, and then just in terms of the monitoring also, um, we've, we've got an assistance from Open Collab with regards to this as well, or not? I don't know, you'll, you'll talk more to this. The monitoring, we're also using the Azure monitoring that they've got available. We've always struggled to find monitoring that gives us monitoring at the application level and not at the server level. And at Azure monitoring, we've got an application insights that help us to get more into the application. It gives us errors on the browser side or on the server side. Here's just an example of you get the number of sessions and the number of users, these are for 14 days. And we also get um, statistics by country or region, the browsers and operating system. But it's been really helpful to be or able to dig in deep uh, to see where the actual problems are. Okay, and then the usual, I think, um, the one thing that is impressive about Tunisia is often our numbers. Um, and yeah, often I think people are, are intrigued by how we, how we get a, around all of this, but, but we do for most part. One of the reasons uh, why the move, because often we're faced with questions from academics, oh, we do two things wrong. We, timing sucks. We always suck at timing. We never have that right. And we're saying to them, okay, other institutions actually close, we don't, so there is no suitable time. Because after exams, then people think, okay, we can easily do our upgrades, and however, the next line of registration is waiting for us. And then it's, we want our exam results. So we don't have the opportunity and the luxury to really do what a lot of the other residential universities get to do from time to time. So we don't have suitable times for upgrades and changes, etc. But for UNISA, staggering is, you know, our continuous growth in terms of numbers and I think in terms of more students, more online activities and more devices um, coming to the platform. So be it a laptop, be it a mobile device, we see that students um, want the online environment. Um, I think now our challenge increasingly is as much as we have many academics who are keen to play with the space and to really go online, we also have those laggers we still have to drag by the feet. Um, so yeah, but those are the spaces that we need to begin to occupy where we start creating certain requirements and certain standards where we make sure that people get on board with some of these activities. So growth is definitely um, on the increase at uni, so we, we don't see a decline in terms of our numbers and activity. Then activities, um, you can see also there, we've only taken you from 2017, 2018, I mean within the span of one year, you can already see the significant, um, significant um, increase. Uh, 2019, we haven't even started the year properly, we're only on April and already we can see the numbers are, are, are climbing here. So I, I'm, I'm expecting that we're probably going to be slightly somewhat higher than 2018. And also obviously the more training that happens and the more you see also, I'm, 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 I'm interested to see over the next few years how we, how we tackle this because Increasingly, you see academics are looking for more functionality. Um, you know, other than whatever Sakai has on offer, we're looking at what else is available out there, what else can we integrate into the platform and use for teaching and learning purposes. And sometimes I think what I struggle with with the academics is, is that a tool is built for a particular reason or it's set up with a certain function. 
So often I make the example and I say to them, if you think about a kettle, the kettle is used for boiling water and sometimes academics come and they use that kettle, but they now want to fry something, deep fry something, or they want to change the color. And you're saying to them, okay, with the tools, you need to understand both affordances and constraints. And so I think that is also an important aspect for us when dealing with our, our teaching community with the academics. And then just to give you some numbers again, um, so we have written assignments, um, so we're just giving you, so those are the numbers that we received, and again, you can see from 2014 up until 2018 that we've had quite a substantial growth. Um, and then we say to you also at the bottom also shows you the numbers that have marked. I don't know if people know about our J router and how we route assignments, etc. Um, but this uh, this weekend basically represented our first substantial peak um, this week weekend because it was the um, the first assignment um, that gives them exam admission that was required now. So usually we, yeah, that's standard practice, but I'm just saying well, our numbers normally skyrocket and then uh, usually it's, uh, we have problems sometimes where students either can't access or um, they time out or whatever the case might be. And I don't think we had any, any challenges um, with this for the last week and weekend. So that, that definitely is a definite plus for us. And then just in terms of our online assessments, our blogs, discussions, and Samigo, our online assessments, you can also see increasingly how the numbers have grown from 2014 to 2018. So again, um, academics are starting to use those online spaces. Um, sometimes also, again, when it relates to affordances, you know, they're going to set up a blog. Um, if you've got 19,000 students as opposed to, say, um, 50 students or 100 students or 200 students for that matter in your course, again, you know, trying to, to explain to them about functionality and about if the tool is is used in a particular way. You also need to understand that there's administration functions for you in the background. So how do you manage those processes? But it's a process. We'll, we will keep working with our academics. So those are our online assessments. And then just in terms of the way forward for us, we don't want to wait too long. We're just going to try and stabilize and try and get ourselves back on our feet. And as soon as they're comfortable, we're gonna, we're gonna give them a jerk again, I'm hoping. So we'd like to do the next upgrade soon. We also want to replace, we currently, we're uh, currently running on Gradebook Classic, so we'd like to do a shift there. And then for our more, um, for, for some of the other tools that we have, we'd like to do some enhancements and, and, and just um, modernize some of those tools and do some improvements on those tools. So that's it from our side. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you. marketing uh, <laughs> open color and also maybe the success lies in all the women in your team <laughs> Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Shane Pachagado. 
and I'm doing a, a joint presentation with our WITS ICT team um, this afternoon. I just want to share with you a few things that we've gone through so far and uh, watch our way forward. Um, first of all, we plan to upgrade to version 12.6 in July uh, uh, to move on to a better system. We had a choice of moving over to 19, but uh, I think we're just going to hold on and most probably go to 12.6 because uh, we had the challenge in the past where uh, our system didn't work that well and all our academics lost faith in the system and we don't want to give them another excuse to say Sakai is not working. <laughs> so we're just trying to be comfortable right now and to keep the momentum going. <coughs> we are uh, presently moving um, conceptualizing smart classrooms across the university. And part of this uh, project, we implementing hardware and software to allow lecturers to record videos directly from the lecture venues or smart classrooms into Sakai as if uh, a one touch button. So we're busy with that. Uh, we've inter it, at presently, we're integrating Blue Explorers, which is a lecturer and a lecture evaluation system that uh, lecturers will be able to launch uh, evaluations in. Sakai, and then from there, students will also be able to, to complete uh, lecture evaluations and lecture evaluations in Sakai. Um, we are presently upgrading the uh, SIMS and Sakai integration to make use of the site members tool, uh, site membership tool. A site membership tool is a this customized tool that allows students to be divided into courses on Sakai. Uh, Presently, we, uh, every five years, we engage with our WITS uh, stakeholders on the use of the LMS and on their needs and, what, uh, and the requirements. And at this present moment, we, we, busy, we started that process again. Uh, since we, because we are a research intensive university, uh, we've got a lot of um, queries about turn it in. And, uh, so what we're busy doing right now is trying to uh, look, uh, look into a chatbot to help to elevate uh, queries that come to the call center. These are just the recent uh, stats for our Sakai usage. <coughs> uh, if in 2017, we had a huge problem in that many of the WITS customized tools started to give problems and then we are sitting that's where our problem started, that uh, many of the academics lost faith in, in, in Sakai being um, uh, was stable. So uh, as um, our colleagues Michelle them did, we contracted Open Collab to assist us in how do we, do we uh, stabilize the system. And we went exactly the same route. We installed our, in order to uh, fix the system, we unbundled all the tools that were giving problems, or should I say, and we installed a, a clean vanilla uh, install. And then um, from, uh, since then, our Sakai stability has improved tremendously. Uh, figures in the light blue show for 2018, uh, there's a big percentage increase already in the new sites, new users, and Turnitin submissions. You may also take note that the Turnitin successful submissions for 2018 already far exceeds 2017, where we had huge problems. Uh, on the teaching and learning side, uh, we've intensified our prerogative of, of uh, implementing blended learning. Uh, towards the end of last year, through a UCTB grant, we contracted two service providers to work with us to develop online courses and blended courses. Uh, the idea was to uh, learn from them and see how their processes work so we can develop our own skills in, in that regard and seeing how they, prov uh, how they develop the courses. So the idea was to develop professional courses and not just uh, courses uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the curve. Um, so our intention next was what we did in the beginning of this year is we've taken it a step further. We decided to uh, take what we've learned and ourselves from what we've learned and then develop our, pers our professional offerings in terms of curriculum development itself. Those courses, um, or should I say uh, offerings itself, is offered on a, on a um, fully online and blended. We're going to be sitting, we've just finished our first round of offerings. We will sit now to review them and see what worked, what didn't work. 
And our intention eventually is to move that process now into to the university-wide uh, environment where we deciding to offer uh, workshops in terms of blended learning, specifically maybe like the Cairo approach. And our issue is uh, scalability in that we, we, we presently working one or two lectures, but it's not scalable in that we're not reaching enough uh, academics. So we would like to eventually from Ju uh, June, July, so far move in where we'll offer uh, blended workshops in terms of one to 15 academics and so forth to move uh, quicker through academics and see how we can we develop in, in terms of blended learning. Um, that's, uh, that's all from us. Thank you.